We are very excited and pleased to announce uh, a new program being put on by the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts, and this is an advanced clinical practice program, and we will put a link to all the information uh, in the show notes if you're interested. This is a program for clinicians who are licensed and have at least five years of experience. It'll be limited to eight participants beginning uh, in the fall, and it will be uh, virtual. And we'll meet four times for four hours and then, of course, the spring semester. And it is for clinicians who are interested in applying Jungian ideas, uh, concepts, and theory uh, to uh, specific clinical cases so that we can see what it looks like in vivo in action. Uh, so it's a lot of thought and planning has gone into it. If you're interested, click on the link and find out more. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to wander into the forest, a significant image in fairy tales, and examine, read, and explore a classic fairy tale that has so much in it. You all know the story, and we're going to read it to you again, Hansel and Gretel. So let's follow the pebbles and into the woods. Hansel and Gretel. A poor woodcutter lived on the edge of a large forest. He didn't have a bite to eat and barely provided the daily bread for his wife and two children, Hansel and Gretel. It reached a point where he couldn't even provide that anymore. Indeed, he didn't know how to solve this predicament. One night, as he was tossing and turning in bed because of his worries, his wife said to him, Listen to me, husband. Early tomorrow morning, you're to take both the children and give them each a piece of bread, then lead them into the middle of the forest where it's most dense. After you build a fire for them, go away and leave them there. We can no longer feed them. No, wife, the man said. I don't have the heart to take my own children and abandon them to the wild beast, for they'd soon come and tear them apart in the forest. If you don't do that, his wife responded, we shall have all have to starve to death. She didn't give him any peace until he said yes. The two children were still awake because of their hunger, and they had heard everything that their mother said to their father. Gretel thought, now it's all over for me, and began to weep pitiful tears. But Hansel spoke, be quiet, Gretel, don't get upset. I'll find a way to help us. Upon saying this, he got up, put on his little jacket, opened the bottom half of the door, and crept outside. The moon was shining very brightly, and the white pebbles glittered in front of the house like pure silver coins. Hansel stooped down to the ground and stuffed his pockets with as many pebbles as he could fit in. Then he went back into the house. Don't worry, Gretel, just sleep quietly. And he lay down again in his bed and fell asleep. Early the next morning, before the sun had even begun to rise, their mother came and woke the two children. Get up, children. We're going into the forest. Here's a piece of bread for you each. Be smart and don't eat it until noon. Gretel put the bread under her apron because Hansel had the pebbles in his pocket. Then they all set out together into the forest. After they had walked a while, Hansel stopped and looked back at the house. He did this time and again until his father said, Hansel, what are you looking at there, and why are you dawdling? Pay attention and march along. Oh, father, said Hansel, I'm looking at my little white cat that's sitting up on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me. You fool, said the mother, that's not a cat, it's the morning sun shining on the chimney. But Hansel had not been looking at the cat. Instead, he'd been looking at the shiny pebbles from his pocket that he had been dropping on the ground. When they reached the middle of the forest, the father said, Children, I want you to gather some wood. I'm going to make a fire so you won't get cold. Hansel and Gretel gathered together some brushwood and built quite a nice little pile. The brushwood was soon kindled, and when the fire was ablaze, the mother said, Now, children, 
lie down by the fire and sleep. We're going into the forest to chop wood. When we're finished, we'll come back and get you. Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and when noon came, they kept eating their pieces of bread until evening. But their mother and father did not return. Nobody came to fetch them. When it became pitch dark, Gretel began to weep, but Hansel said, Just wait a while until the moon has risen. And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took Gretel by the hand. The pebbles glittered like newly minted silver coins and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long and arrived back at their father's house at break of day. Their father rejoiced with all his heart when he saw his children again, for he had not liked the idea of abandoning them alone in the forest. Their mother also seemed to be delighted by their return, but secretly she was angry. Not long after this, there was once again nothing to eat in the house, and one evening Gretel heard her mother say to her father, The children found their way back one time, and I just let go of that. But now there's nothing left in the house except for half a loaf of bread. Tomorrow you must take them further into the forest so they won't find their way back home again. Otherwise, there's no hope for us. All this saddened the father, and he thought it'd be much better to share your last bite to eat with your children. But since he had given in the first time, he also had to yield a second. Hansel and Gretel overheard their parents' conversation. Then Hansel got up and intended to gather pebbles once again, but the parents had locked the door. Nevertheless, he comforted Gretel and said, Just sleep, dear Gretel. The dear Lord will certainly help us. Early the next morning, they each received little pieces of bread, but they were smaller than the last time. On the way into the forest, Hansel crumbled the bread in his pocket and stopped as often as he could to throw the crumbs on the ground. Hansel... Why are you always stopping and looking around? asked the father. Keep going. Oh, I'm looking at my little pigeon that's sitting on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me, Hansel answered. You fool, his mother said. That's not your little pigeon. It's the morning sun shining on the chimney. Now their mother led the children even deeper into the forest until they came to a spot they had never been to before in their lives. Once again, they were to sleep by a large fire and their parents were to come and fetch them in the evening. When noon came, Gretel shared her bread with Hansel because he had scattered his along the way. Noon went by and then evening passed, but no one came for the poor children. Hansel comforted Gretel and said, Just wait until the moon has risen, Gretel. Then I'll see the little breadcrumbs that I scattered. They'll show us the way back home. When the moon rose and Hansel looked for the breadcrumbs, they were gone because the many thousands of birds that fly about the forest had found them and gobbled them up. Nevertheless, Hansel believed he could find the way home and pulled Gretel along with him, but they soon lost their way in the great wilderness. They walked the entire night and all the next day as well, from morning till night, until they fell asleep from exhaustion. Then they walked for one more day, but they didn't find their way out of the forest. They were now also very hungry, for they had had nothing to eat except some berries that they had found growing on the ground. On the third day, they continued walking until noon, Then they came to a little house made of bread, with cake for a roof and pure sugar for windows. Let's sit down and eat until we're full, said Hansel. I want to eat a piece of the roof. Gretel, you can have a part of the window since it's sweet. Hansel had already eaten a good piece of the roof, and Gretel had devoured a couple of small round windows and was about to break off a new one when they heard a shrill voice cry from inside. Nibble, nibble! I hear a louse. Who's that nibbling on my house? Hansel and Gretel were so tremendously frightened that they dropped what they had in their hands, and immediately thereafter, a small ancient woman crept out of the door. She shook her head and said, Well now, dear children, where have you come from? Come inside with me. You'll have a good time. She took them both by the hand and led them into her little house. Then she served them a good meal of milk and pancakes with sugar and apples and nuts. Afterward, she made up two beautiful beds, and when Hansel and Gretel lay down in them, they thought they were in heaven. The old woman, however, was really a wicked witch on the lookout for children, and had built the house made of bread only to lure them to her. As soon as she had any children in her power, she would kill, cook, and eat them. It would be like a feast day for her. Therefore, she was quite happy that Hansel and Gretel had come her way. Early the next morning, before the children were awake, she got up and looked at the two of them sleeping so sweetly, and she was delighted and thought, they'll certainly be a tasty meal for you. 
Then she grabbed Hansel and stuck him in a small coop, and when he woke up, he was behind a wire mesh used to lock up chickens, and he couldn't move about. Immediately after, she shook Gretel and yelled, Get up, you lazy bones. Fetch some water, then go into the kitchen and cook something nice. Your brother's sitting in a chicken coop. I want to fatten him up, and when he's fat enough, I'm going to eat him. But now, I want you to feed him. Gretel was frightened and wept, but she had to do what the witch demanded. So the very best food was cooked for poor Hansel, so that he would become fat, while Gretel got nothing but crab shells. Every day the old woman came and called out, Hansel, stick out your finger so I can feel whether you're fat enough. However, Hansel stuck out a little bone, and the witch was continually puzzled that Hansel didn't get any fatter. One evening, after a month had passed, she said to Gretel, Get a move on and fetch some water. I don't care whether your little brother's fat enough or not. He's going to be slaughtered and boiled tomorrow. In the meantime, I want to prepare the dough so that we can also bake. So Gretel went off with a sad heart and fetched the water in which Hansel was to be boiled. Early the next morning, Gretel had to get up, light the fire, and hang up a kettle full of water. Make sure that it boils, said the witch. I'm going to light the fire in the oven and shove the bread inside. Gretel was standing in the kitchen and wept bloody tears and thought, it would have been better if the wild animals in the forest had eaten us. Then we would have died together and wouldn't have had to bear this sorrow, and I wouldn't have had to boil the water that will be the death of my dear brother. Oh, dear God, help us poor children out of this predicament. Then the woman called, Gretel, come right away over here to the oven. When Gretel came, she said, look inside and see if the bread is already nice and brown and well done. My eyes are weak. I can no longer see so well from a distance, and if you can't see, then sit down on the board and I'll shove you inside. Then you can get around inside and check everything. The witch wanted to shut the oven door once Gretel was inside, for she wanted to bake her in the hot oven and eat her too. This is what the wicked witch had planned and why she had called the girl. But God inspired Gretel, and she said, I don't know how to do it. First, you show it to me. Sit down on the board and I'll shove you inside. And so the old woman sat down on the board, and since she was light, Gretel shoved her inside as far as she could, and then she quickly shut the oven door and bolted it with an iron bar. The woman began to scream and groan in the hot oven, but Gretel ran off, and the witch was miserably burned to death. Meanwhile, Gretel went straight to Hansel and opened the door to the coop. After Hansel jumped out, they kissed each other and were glad. The entire house was full of jewels and pearls. So they filled their pockets with them. Then they went off and found their way home. Their father rejoiced when he saw them again. He hadn't spent a single happy day since his children had been away. Now he was a rich man. However, the mother had died. That's a sobering tale. <laughs> and uh, I was reading from the uh, complete first edition uh, that was recently published, uh, translated and edited by Jack Zipes. So you'll notice we're probably all used to hearing that story as their stepmother wanted to leave them in the forest. But in the original Grimm's, it was their mother. Raising a family, feeding a family, raising children was a difficult business uh, in ancient and not so ancient times. And whether you could afford to feed your children or not was often a big deal. So this was a kind of thing that was a lived reality for many people through the ages. Infanticide through exposure. Yeah. And, of, of course, you know, some of the original orphanages grew from uh, a couple of hundred kids to thousands of kids. And, uh, you know, we know that that's true today as well. The dark side of motherhood is very real. So if we take this less literally and more symbolically, I found myself wondering in the beginning of the tale if the problem with these two adults is that they're unable to be generative, to have adequate agency and competencies in order to survive in the world, and their inner children are a problem for them. I feel like this is a bit of a stretch, but if it's a tale about the struggle when one is overly dominated by one's puella and puer, what does one do? 
how does how do we respond to the ambivalence about childish or childlike behaviors particularly when they put us up against basic functionality in the world so you're moving us uh, right in to the jungian perspective uh, that we can take now on fairy tales which is that everything in the fairy tale is an image of some aspect of an individual psyche or the reader's psyche. Hence, the two parents and the two children represent the adult parts of the psyche that lack agency, as you said, uh, and the young parts of the psyche represented by Hansel and Gretel. And I think about how often we see this in clinical practice where somebody is lamenting their life not launching or not being able to generate enough income or to thrive in the environment. And one of the inquiries that we bring forward as analysts is wondering where the puer puella are in the dreamscape, in the psychic landscape, and whether or not those childlike attitudes are really interfering substantially. And this particular psyche brings forward the solution, which is to somehow dissociate, push away, get rid of the inner children by banishing them into some kind of instinctive forest, into the unconscious. And as we know, generally that's not terribly effective. So I'm wondering about that kind of fierce attitude that the only thing to be done about the inner children is to really just get rid of them. Yes, cut them off. Cut them off. And that's often a frustrated attitude that parents will have with an under-actualized young person. Maybe they didn't go to college or they dropped out and they're kind of languishing in, in the basement, you know, watching TV, playing video games. And there's a conversation going on upstairs. And, you know, often one of the parents are like, God, just kick them out of the house. Just kick them into the forest. Or just get them out of here. And that kind of fierce frustration to solve the the problem of the puer and the puella. Yeah, and, and there's, of course, times when that, you know, kicking them out is that the aggression involved in kicking them out is necessary and appropriate. And and there are times when it's when it's cruel <laughs> and, and inappropriate. I um, have just enjoyed watching this past winter these uh, a wonderful um, hawk cam uh, the Cornell um, University uh, there's a, a couple of hawks that always nest on the campus and the Cornell ornithology lab has rigged these amazing cameras and so I followed these four baby hawks and it's really interesting because the last hawk was hanging in the nest and the parents stopped feeding it because they, they wanted that hawk to get out of the nest. So they stopped bringing food. They were still checking on it, but they, wouldn't, they, were, they cut back the food supply. And apparently this is very normal. And so, you know, there is a time when it's right to say, no more food for you, get out. You know, hawks do it, we do it. But when we have young children, of course, that, that's something else entirely. So there's a question of appropriateness. And I think it touches in this tale you know, on a, a really deep human and archetypal theme, the theme of child abandonment. Whether it's an inner child that we have cut off and refused to allow to grow within ourselves, uh, or, you know, or an actual child or actual young hawks. I mean, as you were saying, Lisa, they, they did feed their babies uh, when they were young, vulnerable, and needy. And that's the case in this tale. The children are young, vulnerable, and needy. And so there's the first attempt to dissociate the children. They're brought into the woods, given some bread, there's a fire set up, and then the parents kind of just disappear. But there's something in the children that is intuitive. Hansel and Gretel have been kind of listening at the door, as our complexes do, by the way. There's nothing we can pull the wool over on our complexes because they're actually in our own brains. 
So <laughs> even though we think we're whispering, the ego thinks it's whispering the great plan to get rid of your child complex, your mother complex, your father complex. Boy, that complex is right there on top of all that information. Mm-hmm. So Joseph, it's so interesting how you went into uh, this fairy tale, starting with the assumption that it was sort of told from the standpoint of the parents, and then the children are images of psychic com- contents or complexes. And of course, that's that's absolutely a, a fascinating and valid way to look at it. We can also flip it and assume that the tale is told from the standpoint of the children. And then we'd be looking at images of the mother and father complexes. And I think it's an an interesting tale in that regard, because we're really then talking about a tale of trauma, that these children have, have been traumatized. Clearly, uh, they've been literally abandoned. The mother clearly is cruel and doesn't love them. And people really have parents like this. And when that happens... There is a real sort of uh, psychic poverty that occurs. You know, it's so clever of Hansel to think about gathering the white pebbles. And, and, that's, and that's great for a while. I mean, it leads them back into the situation of original difficulty because they simply go home. That's not a great option, but at least they're not in the middle of the forest. But then all he has is the bread and the bread's a finite resource, and the birds eat it. So, you know, when, when we are abandoned, abused as children, we really may find that we have fewer psychic resources in life. And that leaves us open to being preyed upon in the midst of the dark and wild forest. I'm thinking, too, about the gullibility and the innocence of Hansel and Gretel, that one might think, oh my gosh, Hansel, um, that's a really dumb idea. You can't scatter breadcrumbs on the forest path. I mean, if we really got very sort of practical and realistic about it, I think most kids would know that. Uh, Also, you really wouldn't be able to see them very well. Uh, So this is um, a solution born of a kind of naivete or desperation. Desperation and a place that is reactive that looks like this is a good solution, but it really isn't. And of course, that theme is continued when they get to the wonderful, magical witch's house that these two children, once again, they go, oh, wow, isn't this great? Um, Let's rip off a piece of the roof. Let's, Let's start eating rather than thinking, Whoa! Wait a minute. This is a uh, this is a little too good to be true. I wonder what's going on here. Well, and this is one of the things that happens when we have been the victims of childhood trauma is we're not very good at protecting ourselves, and we can find ourselves getting back into an adult life uh, situations where we are re-victimized. Yes. And I think that this this fairy tale, it's a brilliant, brilliant image. Like you don't know what's good for you. If you were, let's say you were sexually abused as a child, you may find yourself uh, being repeatedly sexually uh, victimized even in adulthood because you, you didn't, you didn't, your initial instincts were wounded. There was a wounding of the instincts and you, you aren't good at judging what's, what's good for you and, and what ought you to avoid. I mean, I've always thought it was interesting that it was a, a cake and, and candy house because, uh, you know, that's not very filling or nutritious. It's you probably know, more it's... appealing than a pork chop house. <laughs> but, but we could rewrite this, you know, <laughs> which would be my downfall, by the way. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yes, but um, but it it does show the way that that uh, when you've been a victim of trauma, you are susceptible to being easily seduced, perhaps, and that's why there's this notion that that Freud talked about. He named it repetition compulsion, but you know it's it's continues to be borne out that people who've experienced traumas, particularly in childhood, will often find themselves back in situations that are reminiscent of the original trauma. Yeah. 
And we have echoes of it even in popular culture. There was a, a song by Janis Joplin, to mention only one, uh, where you better get it while you can. You have a chance at love and affection. You better get it while you can. And I think that's Hansel and Gretel of there's food, there's cake. Just go for it and grab it. Uh, because the famine that they grew up in, if we think of it psychologically, there's not enough food. Literal food in the tale is the way it's depicted, but it's really nurturing psychological food, parenting, you know, protection, all of those things. And when there is famine and you finally have something to eat, metaphorically speaking, you grab it and you are easily seduced. Building on that, it also seems important that the sequencing of things, which uh, when we interpret dreams, I'm, we're often looking at something that happened that in a sense compels the next thing that happens. So the birds, instinctive creatures that are also associated with the transpersonal, demonstrate this kind of foraging and eating of the bread. And it's as if that instinct is then translated into Hansel and Gretel, and they become the birds, once again, feeding at the bread or the cake of the witch's house. So there's a foreshadowing of this survival capacity mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense in a way. But then again, it's strange and uncanny to come upon this in the woods. But I think when we are reduced to that instinctive level, those higher brain functions are really not kicking in, which I think is true about all of us if we're pushed into survival circumstances. And yes, sometimes that can lead us in the right direction. In a sense it does for them in as much as they don't starve in the woods. They aren't picked off by animals. So even though it's dangerous for them to have to negotiate or ultimately to negotiate with the witch, at least that's a place where they could continue to be alive and to see if they can negotiate with the complexity rather than just give up. So that part of them is still alive and fighting for life. Yeah. I mean, there is this whole interesting thing about um, Hansel when he uh, casts the stones or the breadcrumbs, he's always looking back. You know, I think there's something significant about that because in, in initially there is a looking back. These kids want to go back to uh, the family that they had, even though it wasn't very good. And and we're all like that. If we've if we've had a terribly wounding relationship, an abusive relationship with a parent, there is a tendency to want to look back to the ideal, to the wish for what we we wish we had rather than breaking off from it and moving forward and accepting that uh, we're not going to get what we wanted there. So there's a looking back until it's kind of violently severed and, and then they don't have a choice but to, to move forward and, and seek the new thing. And as you point out, Joseph, I mean, it's, this is the wonderful paradox of fairy tales. I mean, it actually winds up being a, a a pretty good thing to have landed in this witch's house. Not only do they not starve, but eventually it's filled with treasure. You know, the witch always has a treasure. Which is the strange ambivalence about the witch being so dangerous and cannib cannibalistic. But how is it that she's also so generative? That while she is ruthless, she's also a bit of a cornucopia. She's, she represents this fruiting and generative life of the forest, yeah. as well as the ruthlessness of nature. And I, I think psychologically, here's my understanding of that, is if you look at this fairy tale as sort of an image of an abusive uh, childhood, one of the things that happens when there's trauma is there's this kind of split so the child's, the image of the parent in the child's psyche gets split into a kind of idealized parent that the child wishes that she or he had, and, and this kind of entirely negative sort of witch-like parent that the parent may show that face. 
And uh, the child has to kind of negotiate these two versions in the inner world. And one of the things that happens is aggression can get so split off in the psyche of the abused child because it's associated with the negative parent. So people who've been abused can lose their capacity to access their own aggression. And I think that that this happens in, in the story. It's a, it's a sort of a picture because we've got the entirely negative mother, who, by the way, is kind of doubled in the witch. I mean, they're essentially the same person. They die at the same time. But then there's this this kind of positive figure of the father, which is really interesting and complex because we could talk about that. We, sh- we should talk about what that's like. The story changes when Gretel is able to become witch-like and to do the thing that the witch would have done. And that means that she has integrated her aggression. She has accessed her aggression. And then the this negative thing yields all of this uh, new growth and has all of these benefits and, and is, in fact, a treasure when she can own it as her own. And she also exhibits consciousness because she does it by trickery. So she kind of wakes up, gets the picture, and says to the witch, oh, gosh, uh, she plays dumb. Uh, and says, I, I don't understand. I mean, how would I do that? Could you please show me? So I really appreciate the kind of consciousness planning and ability to strategize uh, that Gretel accesses uh, and in order to uh, get the witch uh, into the oven and have her aggression be successful. Uh, she, she doesn't just use brute force. Uh, she has to use her head. Of I get it. Um, we're in a bad situation here. Let me step back, think about this, come up with a plan, and execute it. Literally, execute the plan and the witch. So there's also a, an echo in the fairy tale between the father's independence and capacity being devoured by the wife, that even though he, his own ethical position is saying this shouldn't be happening, but the witchy wife just overrides all of that. And then the witch devouring the masculine, wanting to first devour Hansel. So there's an echo around this consuming and Mm. dismissing of the masculine and this singular Mm -hmm. kind of feminine world, which in this particular tale is that ferocious primal mother, the great mother Mm -hmm. of the forest, Mm -hmm. has kind of taken hold in these several realms and how sobering that is and how familiar that would have been in the ancient world as well, the ruthlessness of nature. So we're really um, kind of circling around the power of the negative mother archetype. Yes. First as the woodcutter's uh, heartless wife who can overpower her husband. You know, one might think that most men would say, are you crazy? We're not going to do that. But that's not what happens in the tale. Then the mother nature of the wilderness, the forest, the wild animals— and then the witch who uh, descends to a level that's just horrifying, which is cannibalism. And, and what does it take to confront the negative mother, which Gretel does? It's not Hansel. It's not the masculine, the young boy who doesn't know enough to realize that scattering breadcrumbs is uh, not going to work. And it's Gretel Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, Lisa, that offers him the bone, that finds the bone, and says, hold this out to the witch, at least in one version. Mm -hmm. Uh, She comes up with the first trick so that Hansel won't be uh, devoured too quickly. And then it's Gretel, the positive young feminine who accesses her trickster Mm -hmm. and her aggression. Mm -hmm. And I I remember as a child reading these fairy tales, discovering them in the library, and the surge of 
glee that I felt when Gretel shoved that old bitch into the oven. <laughs> and she had it coming. And it was such a vicarious victory. Well, and, you know, she does access her trickery to do it. And then, you know, the, the tale is so explicit that the witch is groaning and writhing. <laughs> but Gretel oh, wonderful. lets her burn. Yes. Right? Yes. So she has to find that kind of hard place in herself. Yeah. Just like her mother had that, you know, I'm going to let the kids starve in the forest. You know, one of the things, and I, I know I've said this before on the podcast, I think if we had a sort of uh, traumatogenic relationship with a parent, we can feel like the anger that we saw that parent uh, evidence is so destructive that we kind of tell ourselves, I'm never going to be like my mom. I'm never going to be angry. I'm never going to be unkind. It can be very difficult to have a positive relationship with aggression if a parent's aggression uh, traumatized us. And I think that's maybe what Gretel's coming to terms with in this story. And if it was normalized. Yes. Uh, which it is in the tale. It's as as if... Uh, oh, gee whiz, um, we simply have a household problem here. There isn't any more food. I guess we'll just have to take the kids out into the forest and abandon them. Uh, and there's a bit of an objection on the part of the father. But it's real. It, the, the, the traumatic significance of it is really minimized in the tale. As we as readers go, oh, my gosh, you can't do that. Uh, but I think that is the traumatogenic field, is that what is going on that is really traumatic, uh, it's as if it's not that big a deal. And if we move it purely intrapsychically, that both Hansel and the father are helpless in the orbit of the negative mother, which is something that Jung and particularly Neumann writes about in the History and Origins of Consciousness, that when the masculine or the ego is insufficiently developed and or there's just too much big stuff going in the unconscious, there's a constant concession to the unconscious, which is typified here as the dark mother. So both of them are overwhelmed and succumb. And then Gretel as the anima gains power finally in this realm, and it's the anima that both fosters relatedness and ethics and a kind of civil, civilized approach to this. She's the one who separates Hansel from the witch and, in a sense, replaces the negative mother in the father's world, and she's able to liberate this consciousness from the grip of the mother. And that's a very much a progression and a recognized process, both in a woman's psyche and in a man's, in as much as we all need to get out of the grip of the unconscious in order to be able to move forward, have a life, but also to be able to have a world full of ethical constraints. Because the forest does not have any ethic beyond survival and that the foundational great mother inside of all of our bodies is nature. I mean, our bodies are forests. So we have these survive at any cost impulses. And the anima gives us something different. It's the anima that brings empathy, compassion, loyalty, alternatives, relatedness, something that's above survival needs. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful 2015 film by M. Night Shyamalan called The Visit, which picks up uh, this fairy tale and has some wonderful references to it. It really, I think, is playing with the same territory psychologically. These two teenagers, their father has left them, their father has left the family. The mother, their mother was abandoned by her parents when she got pregnant with them. 
And so these two teens have never met their grandparents, but they're invited for a visit. So they they go to visit, and and uh, their their grandparents are just terribly, terribly odd and frightening. And as the film goes on, they they get weirder, and uh, things get get spookier. And there's a great, great scene with an oven. It absolutely is kind of picking up on these themes of not being able to access the sort of inner good enough parents or the the inner positive parental imagos or complexes until you can sort of do battle with those negative parental complexes. And these two teenagers have to um, contest with these uh, really demonic, diabolical grandparents before they can uh, engage in some psychological healing and, and access positive parental support, both inner and outer. I think that makes perfect sense. I'm also m- moved to talk about this as a cultural issue, that in terms of even the policies that governments make, policy changes in the United States, that the kill or be killed dynamic is part of this forest at the base of the psyche. For instance, the huge debate happening in the United States about guns and gun laws. And on one side, there is, you know, the, f- the great mother of the forest saying, everyone must have a lethal capacity because how could you survive in the great ruthless forest of the world. So we all have to have metaphoric talons and fangs and ability to fight and kill. And in the modern world, that's showing up as access to an incredible amount of firepower and guns. And then the other side, which I think is the voice of the anima saying, can't we cultivate a different kind of relatedness Can't we rise above this kind of fierce forest paganism and believe that an ethical commitment and cultivation, a higher way of holding ourselves, could actually transcend that primal impulse and shape it somehow differently? So this is happening all the time and everywhere this tension between the most primal parts of us and our attempts to create a civilization based on different values, higher values. The forest was not the enemy. They did not get devoured by wild animals. They even found some berries to eat along the way. The real danger is from the human world And uh, those negative aspects of human nature, it doesn't get much worse than cannibalism. And I think the parallel you're making uh, to a current cultural complex is really great of do we assume uh, that out there in uh, our cities that we must go armed into those forests? Uh, Or is there a different way of relating, uh, that the danger is within, within us, within a human psyche. It's not out there. And it, of course, also images the classic uh, Jungian theme of what is the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. Does the ego need to be armed and ready Because the unconscious, the forest, is the enemy? Or or is there a different relationship uh, with the unconscious? And the forest, of course, is a classic symbol of of the unconscious in fairy tales and in myth. Uh, So as I think it's a cartoon character, Pogo said, uh, the enemy is us. (laughs) And and also building on that a little bit, I think... uh, I think that this image of kind of going into the forest, wandering in the forest, and happening upon the witch, it's very fitting because if we have a negative parental complex, we do tend to meet that out in the world again and again and again. 
We, we seek it out. Unconsciously. We smell it out and then we run at it and we take that exact job to be around yes. that destructive force or we marry that person or mm -hmm. we dismiss 10 other people we dated but yeah. we can't take our eyes off of the 11th. That's very much like the problematic family dynamics. Yeah. And that circles back to what you mentioned before, Lisa, the repetition compulsion. Mm -hmm. That there is something magically, unconsciously, dynamically attractive about that impossible job or boss or, or date or mate uh, so that part of us hopes that this time it'll come out different. And another part uh, is reliving the same old story of defeat, which is why it's called repetition compulsion. And I think that for Jung, and von Franz, of course, was so incredibly articulate about all of this, feeling that fairy tales survived within cultures, maybe for even thousands of years before they were recorded, because they're offering a solution. So the fairy tale, I think, could be offering us a way out of the repetition compulsion, because something is solved Yes. through these symbolic actions. Yes, yes, where yes. finally, one has to see the witch for what she is. One has to tell the truth about the danger and cost of continuing to dance with the problematic figures in our lives. And at a certain point, we have to take a stance. And, you know, Gretel's stance is, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. When a character dies in a fairy tale, it what that means psychologically is often that that trait has now been integrated. So she doesn't have to exist as the separate thing. So Gretel now has that ability to be aggressive. It's not projected onto this witchy figure. And then she gets the treasure. So speaking of treasures, maybe it's time to switch to a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Our dreamer today is a 37-year-old female who is a bookseller. And here's her dream. I'm on an ocean beach looking out to my one-room house that juts out on a dock above where the waves break. The house could use some work and a coat of paint, but there's a feeling of pride as I gaze over it. I look down and notice I'm wearing a peasant dress, which is not at all my style and better suited for a little girl. A craggy cliff looms to the left side of the beach. From around the cliff, two sea monsters appear swimming near my house on the water. I wasn't afraid of them, but watched them calmly. As they approach, they begin to rock the walls of the house, and I continue to watch powerlessly as they wrest it from its dock and tear it out to sea. The sea monsters retreat over the horizon and the house begins to sink. I am then inland, but not far from the beach, at a pub in a seaside town. I see my parents in a booth, engaged in a fiddle contest. 
They are my parents, I know this to be sure, but they are monstrous apparitions, soft as puppets and with frighteningly large heads. I try to tell them about my house and that it's gone, expecting some kind of comfort or perhaps an invitation to stay with them. They glance my way, but they don't acknowledge me, nor that I'm in distress. The fiddle contest goes on uninterrupted. The barkeep tells me that if I'm not there for the fiddle contest, then I will have to leave. The dream ends as I struggle to breathe. For context, she writes, I recently committed to buying an apartment in New York City, something I never expected to do entirely on my own. The down payment alone will wipe out my bank account, which causes me some worry, but I have a good job and expect to be able to manage the mortgage payments. I long for partnership, for someone to share the most intimate joys and struggles, and though I'm always dating and meeting new people, a long-time connection with the kind of depth for someone to really know me has been out of reach. Her main feelings were, at first a peacefulness and pride, then loneliness, powerlessness, a desire to be loved, and abandonment. She adds a few associations and writes, I have a comforting relationship with the element of water and with the tarot, and was recently shown a pack of tarot cards made by a lover that featured two sea monsters. My parents are musicians, and as a child they would often leave me, the eldest daughter, to care for my siblings when they were out at gigs. Now in my late thirties, after a long struggle with addiction and a recovery without much support from my family, I'm finally discovering who I really am, which means acknowledging parts of my history that I can no longer ignore. So my first curiosity, just starting at the very beginning, is the dream ego's orientation to the one-room house. I'm on an ocean beach, which is often a liminal space because the water and the land are meeting at this point in this kind of churning, dynamic place. And she is looking out to her one-bedroom house that juts out on the dock above where the waves break. She's not in it, but she's looking at it as an object. And it's um, it seems to be very precarious. I mean, I, I don't have a really good sense, maybe, of how this, but it, it literally juts out, and the waves break beneath it. And, you know, I think we've all seen real estate kind of like that, sort of breathtaking. <laughs> yes. Somebody gets sucked out into the ocean in the outer yeah. banks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. But, but it feels like uh, she she now has something. She has a one-room house. It needs a coat of paint, but she's proud of it. But it's precarious. Very precarious. You know, um, this situation reminds me of the story of the three little pigs. Mm, and great. they they have to set out on the road um, as they enter their adulthood, and it's time for them to live independently. And the first little pig builds his house out of straw, and the second one out of sticks, and the third one finally out of bricks. So from her context and, and setting out into a more independent life now in her 30s and coming to terms with some life issues, it feels like her dream house, you know, is that first attempt mm -hmm. to, to build a structure uh, that is independent and that's just hers. But it's not well the foundation is not solid. It's on a dock. It's above the water. Uh, it's vulnerable to the elements, etc. Yeah, it's vulnerable to the ocean. And the monsters in the in unconscious. The ocean, right. oh, I mean the ocean, the <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, it, the, the dream mirrors this outer situation where it feels very precarious buying this condo in New York City. But I think it probably refers to the inner world as well, that there's some kind of consolidation of her own stance that is feeling a little shaky right now because of these monsters. 
And uh, first of all, you know, who can redress, who can resist a dream of sea monsters? But uh, what do we make of these sea monsters? What I noticed is that there are two sea monsters, and later there are two parents who are monstrous. Yes. So I think that we are looking here. I mean, this is another case where I didn't knowingly pick a dream thinking about our topic, but I, I think we might have a little bit of a Hansel and Gretel situation going on here where there was some real abandonment in childhood. And that has made it very difficult for this dreamer to make her way that she's been susceptible. Uh, she's been susceptible to addiction, which is one of the things I wish I'd said back when we were talking about the nature of the gingerbread house in Hansel and Gretel, is that when we are abandoned or abused as children, we often will be more susceptible to addictions later because it seems like it's a quick and easy thing to fill us up and we, we, have, we have a lack. This dreamer is, has struggled, I imagine, with finding some solid ground in her life because of what may have been experienced as a abandonment in childhood by these parents who seem to kind of leave her to her own devices and ask her to take care of her siblings. And that when she did suffer uh, with addiction, she felt she didn't have much support. And I think that is really imaged in the dream. Uh, when she goes, interestingly, to a pub, uh, well, there are, there's an addictive substance offered at every pub, uh, namely alcohol, and her parents are engaged in a fiddle contest. So we could imagine that that's a metaphor for fiddling around uh, when the dreamer, the dream ego, needs comfort and needs uh, some reassurance and needs, needs some help uh, because her house, her essential sense of self, has just been washed away. I, I find myself, despite the traumatic imagery, um, being curious about perhaps a positive telos around this. If we remember that gods and monsters are also synonymous, and gods can seem like monsters when they show up and do something that the ego doesn't like. So if we were to just say that the dream ego, dressed much like a child, and perhaps from a child's perspective, has built kind of a dollhouse, mm -hmm. just a one-room house kind of hovering yeah. on a dock. And yes, of course, she's proud of it in the dream, but it's also something perhaps that is appropriate for a child. I remember my two sisters having a dollhouse when we were growing up. It was a lovely one-room little uh, representative of what a full-size house might be. But at a certain point, it gets abandoned because it's no longer interesting developmentally. But I'm wondering here, as you said, that the house represents the concept of home, which the ego may have been clinging to, reproducing, being overly sentimental about or overly attached to, and finally, something from the depths of the unconscious says, enough, enough, comes up, doesn't harm the ego, it says this concept of what home means, it's going to go. We're done with this. And so it takes it, they swim off, and that's their job, is to kind of break down this thing that isn't working at all. And then it's to followed by... To let go of the fantasy. Right. The fantasy, the misperception, somehow an image, a vision, which isn't congruent with who the dreamer really is in their fullness which is then followed by an attempt to regress, which is already suggested with the child's outfit. And luckily so, there isn't support in the psyche for a regression, that the inner parents just kind of ignore the plaintive calls. On one sense, of course, that's heartbreaking. If this really happened in real life, we would hope that our families would rally but this is a psychological event. And so just as we were talking earlier about Hansel and Gretel, 
sometimes there's a ruthlessness that needs to rise up in the psyche, particularly here at midlife, 37, where whatever coping mechanisms we've been using, that the self is just laying waste to it. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, she's left with the absolute sense that it's all on me. I have to decide, discover, create, build. And a reference that I would just toss to the dreamer, which I think is a marvelous resource. It's a book by an Irish analyst named John Hill, and it's called At Home in the World. And it really beautifully amplifies the whole search for, need for, a place to belong, which I think would be helpful. I'm also struck at the very end. Uh, her house has been wiped away, and then she goes to the pub. Her parents don't notice her. And then we have a, a little bit player who's significant, namely the barkeep, uh, the masculine uh, contrasexual element in the dream. And he says, if you're not there for the fiddle contest, if you're not there to fiddle around, is the way I imagine it, then you have to leave. Uh, so it builds on what you've been saying, Joseph, of the telos of the dream is, out you go. No, you don't have a house at the end of the dock. And no, you're not going into a pub and staying, being allowed to stay, and you're not going to fiddle around. And it may be pretty anxiety-producing, as it is, uh, because she says the dream ends as I struggle to breathe. It's really a lot of anxiety. But the telos uh, does seem to you know, really validate what she's doing in, in the outer world of buying her own apartment on her own and feeling overextended, and it's a big step, and I'm all alone in this, but off you go. Yeah, I really like what both of you are saying, and just to build on it a little bit, there's this sense that her, so so, so the, the parental images, in some sense, show up in this dream as uh, sea monsters, and then these monstrous apparitions that are, you know, look like puppets with frightfully large heads, which says something about the fact that the relationship with the parents still seems to be governed very much by the archetypal energies of the mother archetype and the father archetype. They haven't kind of gotten cut down to human size. They still have all of this incredible energy attach them. It's like the archetype hasn't been appropriately mediated. And so these, these parents have sort of this outsized energy about them. And, and, you know, that is part of the task of growing to adulthood is being able to really take it in that your parents are actually just people. And to recognize that the archetypal element of it belongs in its own world and that you could have a different relationship with that energy. But it's going in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, this telos idea that you lifted up, Joseph. Yes. Uh, because it goes from sea monsters to the parents being monstrous apparitions. S so they are being somewhat humanized. Uh, the trajectory yeah. is... It's a hopeful and positive trajectory. And then I think, as you both have said, at the end of the dream, it's like, yeah, you can't look for anything there. So go ahead and go about your own life and make of it what you will. Stop looking back. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.